Okay, so let's go through our 17 tips on intubation. I couldn't decide what was more important, so they're all in a really random order. Okay, tip one, realize the more intubations that you do, the better that you will be at it. It's awful missing an intubation. You feel horrible for the baby. It's embarrassing. You feel ashamed. You hate that you put the baby through that extra trauma. You wonder why everybody else makes it look so easy. But just realize that missing that intubation makes you one step closer to being very proficient at actually intubating. Yes, you could have not tried it at all and not missed it and not felt bad, but you will never become a proficient intubator until you carry on attempting it. So every missed intubation also makes you closer to being excellent at intubating. So try to get those intubation attempts when you can. Watch other people as they're intubating. Watch for different styles and different techniques. Eventually you will get it. Everybody can get this. Tip two. My friend and program director, Dr. Susie Bookter, taught me this very early in fellowship. And that is, do not accept any view of the chords. The more central that the chords are in your vision, the easier that it will be to actually thread the endotracheal tube through the chords. If you can just see a slit of the chords right at the top, or they're like buried somewhere under the epiglottis and you haven't like been able to lift the epiglottis up high enough, you're probably not going to be able to get the endotracheal tube through it. So either move the baby or move the blade so that you could try to get a better view. So maybe the baby is too hyperextended and you need to kind of push the jaw forward a bit. Maybe the baby needs a neck roll under its neck. Maybe you need to put more pressure up on the blade. Maybe you need more cricoid pressure. Whatever it is, try to get as good a view as you can before you try to thread the endotracheal tube. The third tip is make sure that you have the baby at the right level for you. So maybe the baby's on a bed that is just too high or too low for you and it's just really difficult to position yourself to be able to see the cords. Ideally, the level of the bed should be somewhere at the level of your lower rib cage. And make sure that you move the bed if the bed can be moved and you do have the time so that you are in a perfect position. Sometimes if the cords are really anterior, you still have to kind of like duck a little to be able to get that view of them. But I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen somebody really tall, basically kind of squatting down, trying to intubate at the level that the bed was made for me. And I'm short. The fourth tip is to use the curve of the endotracheal tube to do a lot of your work. So even if the vocal cords are like really anterior, then you can still make the tube kind of make that curve and go through the vocal cords like that. Obviously with a stylet, that's a lot easier, but there's a reason why these ET tubes are curved. Also remember that if they get hot, under the radiant warmer, then they become softer and much bendier and they kind of lose their curve and they're harder to actually position. So make sure the endotracheal tube doesn't get too hot. The fifth tip is, is that maybe you are using the wrong size blade. And honestly, I see this a lot in the unit and it's often a reason why somebody is missing their intubations. So blades come in different sizes. This is a size zero, which is the most commonly sized blade that we would use in the unit. This is a size one. Really, we rarely use these, mostly for kind of big term babies, maybe a big surgical baby that needs to be intubated. The vast majority of the time, you need a size zero. For the tiny babies, the 22, 23, 24 weekers, you're probably using a double zero. But sometimes you just don't get a good view of the cords. So let it cross your mind that maybe the anatomy is slightly different in this baby's mouth and try looking with a different sized blade. The sixth tip is, is that try to stick to those 30 seconds that you have per NRP for an intubation attempt. So per NRP, you have 30 seconds to try to intubate. If the baby is unstable, then you should stop if you really aren't seeing the vocal cords, or if it's been longer than 30 seconds, then you should stop. If the baby isn't doing well, then maybe pass off the attempt to somebody else. If the baby is stable, then use that time to reconsider what could you be doing differently? Does the baby need to change its position? Do we need a different blade? Did you get a good view of the cords or not? So make sure that you're sticking to that time. Our seventh tip is try to make sure that the baby is as stable as possible during the intubation attempt. 
Obviously, it would help trying to get it sooner, but also let the baby have the support that it needs. A recent study in the New England Journal showed that if babies are supported with high flow nasal cannula, eight liters of high flow nasal cannula during the intubation attempt, they are uh, much less likely to have physiological instability and the attempts are more likely to be successful. So consider or make sure that you're giving the babies the support that they need. Our eighth tip is to remember the importance of pre-medication. So pre-medication, whether it's a pain medication or, or a mild sedative uh, or other types of medication, have been shown in multiple trials to decrease the time and the number of the intubation attempts, as well as to decrease the amount of trauma that's related to the intubation attempts. So everybody should really consider pre-medicating babies before an intubation attempt. We'll talk a lot more about the medications themselves in the next video. My ninth tip is to use reading glasses. I know that I've said this before. I know a lot of you are way too young to even be thinking about this, but just hear me out. Right now, my eyes aren't good. After I passed like 40, I had to start wearing reading glasses for everything. But when I go to intubate, I use reading glasses with a higher refractive index. So my vision is actually way better than 2020 when I go to intubate. And so I get such a great detailed view of the back of the oropharynx. I mean, I can look at the vocal cords and tell you if there's something on the vocal cords because basically I'm kind of intubating with a magnifying glass. It's really what the surgeons do. They're wearing their loops when they do their operations. So just consider it. I promise it. If you try using reading glasses once with any procedure, you're going to be hooked. My 10th tip is to try to learn without a stylet. And a stylet, I'm sure, as a lot of you know, is kind of that like long piece of metal that you put down the middle of the endotracheal tube so that you can guide the endotracheal tube easier. And really, there are three reasons why you might want to try without a stylet. The first one is it's just one more piece of equipment. And if you're in a rush or it's an emergency or you're in the ER or something, then somebody might not actually have that stylet. So it's nice not needing it to actually do the procedure. The second one is, is that even though it is a pretty skinny metal tube, it is very hard and it does have the ability to cause a lot more trauma. So it could be kind of like a little bit of mild irritation or it could be something a lot more serious like an esophageal perforation. And the third thing is, is that it's really nice having another trick in the bag if you do end up having a really hard intubation. So for example, if there's like a Pierre Robin with a really tiny chin, then sometimes it's really difficult to pass those vocal cords without a stylet. And it's just nice having this other layer of help if you're not used to using a stylet. Having said all of that, it's better to get an intubation in one attempt with a stylet than in like four attempts without a stylet. So you do you, just get used to what you're doing but just be slightly more aware of trauma if you are using a stylet. The 12th tip is is that sometimes as you're going to actually intubate the vocal cords are shut and you can't actually put the endotracheal tube through the vocal cords. So sometimes I'll just put the, vo the endotracheal tube right there right at the entrance of the vocal cords and kind of wait for the baby to take a breath. You really don't want to push it through. You'll do damage to the vocal cords. Or if somebody's right there, I'll ask them to slap the baby's feet or pinch the baby's feet so that they take a gasp and then you can push the vocal cords through. The 13th tip is what to do when it's a really difficult intubation. So normally it's a difficult intubation because the neck is really short or there's some really weird anatomy like a high arch palate or a cleft palate or because the cords are really anterior, so like really towards the, the front of the face and you really have to get that tube up there. So the most important thing that you could do is try to position everything as appropriately as possible. So make sure that the head isn't hyperextended. You'll never be able to reach anterior cords if it's hy hyperextended. In fact, in some cases, it really helps jotting the jaw all the way forward and kind of taking it from a more superior view. The other thing that really helps with anterior cords is a lot of cricoid pressure. I really recommend getting used to delivering your own cricoid pressure. As soon as somebody is like pressing on the neck, they could easily knock the vocal cords out of you. So really get used to using your pinky finger to press on the cricoid to try to kind of drop those vocal cords into view. The 14th tip is to set up the environment as well as possible for you. It is a really stressful procedure. When a baby needs an intubation, you have to get that intubation. There's no let's try it again tomorrow. 
And studies have shown that the more people that are watching, the more stressful it is. So get people out of the room. I always send parents out of the room for an intubation. I think there's absolutely no reason why that procedure should be etched into a parent's mind even if it's the easiest intubation on the planet. So I'll send parents out of the room. You also don't need 500 people watching you and half the NICU. So let everybody move out of the way as possible. The 15th tip pertains to suction. So obviously, and we'll talk about this in the next video, you should have suction available. A lot of times babies can be really juicy and they have a lot of secretions everywhere. However, I think that we often suction babies a little bit too much. Very often when you're not seeing the vocal cords, when you go to intubate, it's not because there's a pool of secretions there. It's because you're not anterior enough and the vocal cords just haven't dropped into view. So before you even try to suction the baby, move everything around. I really will only suction if I can directly see that the fluids are blocking the vocal cords. Because if you're just suctioning, just hoping to get a better view, then the baby's a lot more likely to vagal, it adds extra time, and it's just not good for the whole intubation attempt. So really try to avoid suctioning unless you really feel that the baby needs it. The 16th tip, the 16th tip I can say it, is to make sure that the bulb of the blade is actually working. So these, these laryngoscopes are actually um, disposable. So they come like this in a bag, we undo the bag and use them immediately. But a lot of laryngoscopes that are used have to kind of be assembled right before use. So part of it is making sure that there is actually a light at the end of that so that you can get a really good view when you go to intubate. I will say that even if the bulb is working, sometimes it just isn't bright enough. And there have been a couple of times where people have missed intubations and you bring out, you bring out the laryngoscope and you see that the bulb is really dull, you know, changed out the laryngoscope and suddenly everything is crystal clear back there. So just be aware that even if there is a light, it might not be bright enough. The 17th tip is to not trust the PD cap blindly. So as you all know, the PD cap is like a little CO2 monitor that you put on the end of the endotracheal tube after you intubate and it will change color to yellow or another color depending on the brand if there is CO2 in the endotracheal tube, which means that you're in the correct place. Sometimes, even if you are in the correct place, it doesn't actually change color. It could be because the baby's really shocky or because the baby's absolutely tiny and doesn't have good cardiac output yet. So after you actually intubate, then you should also be looking for other signs of intubation. Obviously, hopefully you're watching the ET tube go through the vocal cords, but also hopefully the heart rate starts coming up. The breath sounds can be heard bilaterally in the chest. You see mist in the endotracheal tube. The oxygen saturation starts coming up. These are all good signs that the baby was intubated and they might all occur before you even see the PD cap change color. The other thing that can happen is sometimes the endotracheal tube is too deep and it's kind of going all the way into the right bronchus and that in itself could block off kind of the CO2 coming up and the PD cap might not change color. So sometimes you just have to kind of pull it back a little bit. But let me tell you, when you know that you're in and it's not changing color, that is like one of the longest one to two minutes of your life in those like really shocky babies when you know that you've actually intubated. And once again, I want to remind you that just like everything else in medicine, it's all experience. Yes, some people are slightly naturally better at procedures than others, but I would still prefer to have the person that's intubated a hundred times who was extremely uncoordinated the first few times versus the gifted intern that's only intubated three three times. So really try to get those procedures where you can. The more you do, the better that you'll be. Okay, thanks so much for being here. I'm Dr. Tala and this is Tala Talks NICU. Like this video if you learned anything. I'd love to hear your own tips on intubation. If you do write to us, then please let us know where you're from and subscribe to the channel if you are interested in overall neonatal education and joining our little community here. Thank you so much for being here.